so today's presentation is about the basics of biosafety level two and um, but I will start a little bit with the the um, the basics of biosafety in general as well. Can, may I ask if you can um, please allow wh whoever joins the presentation in the background also to the they will it will say uh, people are waiting in the lobby if you can just allow them to join it I'd appreciate that. Right. So the outline of what we're going to talk about, I will talk about the biohazards, biosafety and, and risk assessment, basically everything that has to do with biosafety. We'll um, go through the different levels of biosafety. Then I'll move on to the hazard controls that we will implement in our laboratory. I will talk about decontamination and disinfection. And um, although it might not be biosafety itself, it is in all our um, SOPs as well as the emergency procedures when you visit my lab specifically. And right, the last um, slide will give you some biosafety resources that I found very useful and quite nicely packaged in a in a something that we can watch um, as well. Right. So biohazards, biosafety, and risk assessments. Biohazards include any biological agents or substances that can cause human or animal disease and may present a hazard to the health of the individual working with the agent, but also um, may be hazardous to the community or the environment if the agent is not discarded appropriately. So when we talk about bio biosafety, it includes everything from transport to waste management in the end. Uh, these um, biohazards could include microorganisms such as bacteria, viruses, parasites, fungi, yeast, uh, anything like that, but also samples from humans or animals that we, you might not be aware that they are infected, but because it comes from a living organism, they might very easily have some bacteria, viruses, parasites, fungi, um, etc. Um, so why did we need to certify our SAFRA resins microscopy unit? Why is the chain, why did this, the change just come now? So the main reason is that we uh, accept human derived samples. We have blood samples sometimes delivered. We have um, biopsies delivered for cryosectioning. Um, some of us, our users, bring live cell cultures for imaging or for, for cell sorting. It can be either microorganisms or mammalian. And then we, we often deal with recombinant DNA and GMOs. Um, for example, the fact that we image um, M-cherry, GFP, YFP, CFP, all of those are genetically modified organisms. So we have to have some the procedures in place to handle these um, these samples. Also, we sometimes get environmental samples that we do not know what the contents are. It could be water samples. Um, it could be um, uh, soil, soil water, water from soil. It, it can be various. I often get um, uh, compost as well. We do not know exactly what is in there and what the hazard could be of these unknown contents. So that's why we had to um, certify the fluorescence microscopy unit. So what, what, does, what, is, what is the term biosafety then referring to? So biosafety then addresses the safe handling and the containment of the, the infectious microorganisms and hazardous biological material. It also prevents accidental exposure and also releasing to the environment. So everything that we, we put in place is to prevent um, this exposure and release. The biosafety is usually done in a model of risk assessment. You have to do risk assessment first and um, we'll deal with that in the next few slides. And um, then what the biosafety uh, implications are is that you have to apply established principles and practices. It's not that you can decide in my lab I want to do this or that. There are very strict um, there are already guidelines as to what should be done and what should be worn and how you should um, discard waste in a biosafety level two or whichever biosafety level laboratory. Risk assessment. So um, why do we need to do a risk, risk assessment? If you do not do a risk assessment, you assume too many things. Um, we have to identify the hazards involved in every sample, in every type of analysis you do. You need to think about what training is needed to the people who are working with these samples. You have to have some form of and, and spend some time to think about improvements of procedures. 
Um, you have to evaluate your equipment. They have to be certified. Um, and very important, the risk assessment is there to reduce the liability of the lab, of the university, of the people who work with it. Um, you, it it's actually very, very important. And then, of course, the most important thing, it improves the safety. If you do a risk assessment and you deal with all these these things, it makes it a safe environment for everyone to work in. When do you do a risk assessment? Um, usually, definitely before a project commence, you need to think what are, what are you going to use, what are the chances of things happening, etc. But you can also do um, a risk assessment after the project started. Things might not seem as they were before you started the project and you realize things as soon as the project starts. Um, there could be changes to the project, there could be changes in the agent, and so from time to time there's even uh, changes to legislation. Of course, new people to a project is also a major change. You have to do a risk assessment as soon as new people are involved in a project. Um, sometimes also when, they are new, when there's new information available, you might not have realized that a certain um, agent is, can, can, can um, pose some hazards, and eventually through some research uh, it, it becomes clear that that agent is more hazardous than, than was uh, assumed before. And then also um, risk assessments are usually re-evaluated um, on an annual basis. So if you don't know, annual basis is the most important together with the uh, before project commence. Um, and then what is very important, it's not something that happens in isolation. A lab cannot decide just for themselves, okay, I think this is okay and that's okay. Um, there's usually a, a committee that's involved in the risk assessment. Um, the reason for this is that it's basically a clear team or a team effort is that different people have different uh, perceptions of what a risk is and what is important and what is dangerous. And then also diff there's different risk tolerances. What is uh, acceptable for to, to one person might not be acceptable to another person. So it's best that a team of people who are used to and can compare the risks from one lab to another is involved in, in assessing this risk that you um, that you pose. So um, it's not something you can do in isolation. How do you do a risk assessment? The first thing is that you need to consider what's the possibility of an event um, that can cause a hazard, what is the severity if it happens, and what are the consequences if something hazardous happens. So in the next table, I'll show you, um, if you look at uh, probability, if you have something that could happen frequently, um, I get samples of water from the river. People want to analyze river, river water. It, I, I get it frequently. I can be frequently exposed to it, but really the severity of me being exposed to, to river water is very low. There's, there's very low risk to being exposed to river water. Where if, if I say, okay, I am being exposed to, I don't know, a, a, some sort of a um, bacteria. I, I, I shouldn't be um, exposed to TB because we don't accept TB samples, um, unfixed TB samples. So the probability that I would get in contact with TB, live TB samples are quite low. But if I do get in in, um, in contact with um, with the um, TB, live TB, it is actually quite critical. Um, there are uh, things that can, um, they, there's things that can be done, there's uh, uh, treatment, etc. but it is still critical if I do get TB, so it's a moderate risk to have uh, TB samples in your lab, for example. Um, so you have to look at what is the probability of you being exposed to, to a hazard, and then if I'm exposed to that hazard, what is the severity of that exposure? And that is how you would say then, okay, this is a moderate risk sample, or that is a high risk sample, or this is actually still a low risk sample. Right. So the fact is that you should consider when you do a risk assessment, uh, the, the one source talk about five Ps, you have to think about the people that are involved, the PPE available, what procedures are going to be to take place, what is the place where it's going to take place, um, and then the pathogen. So if I just expose, span a little bit on each, the people, um, is it postgraduate students, is it undergrad student, students, is it um, people at the NHS who has done this for 30 years, they have experience, they, they are fully trained, 
But also then age. Are these people at an age where they are at higher risk than someone in their 30s or 20s? Um, how, what is the immune st status of the people? That someone who's pregnant, a pregnant person has a much, is much more prone um, or vulnerable than someone who's not pregnant. And then also exposure and duration. If it's a exposure to duration and frequency, I get say I get TB fixed TB samples every say twice a year, um, and I only image them for an hour. I really don't work with them eight hours a day, three three days a week. Then my risk is much smaller than um, if I am working in a TB full TB lab. Um, the PPE is of course then also to help prevent. Um, a person to to be exposed to um, so we will talk about PPE a little bit later then in terms of the environment um, the procedures that you are going to to do we do not culture cells so the, already that risk is a lot lower because we don't have culture media in the lab we don't have an incubator so the risk of having full full-blown con contamination in the lab is much less than for a cell culture lab for example where cells are grown there's media etc but um, the place, remember there are clin clinical laboratories where they work with human samples every day. There's research laboratories that most of us are involved with. And then in, in the field, it might be completely different risks in a field um, setup than there is in a laboratory. So that also has to be included in a risk assessment. And then you need to think about the pathogen. Um, what type of bacteria, viruses, parasites? Um, is it animals that could be contaminated? Are we working with recombinant DNA? Um, so, whatever the pathogen is, is also part of the risk assessment. How, uh, how bad would exposure be and what would be the consequences? And then, of course, is it in a high concentration or low concentration, high volumes or low volumes? In my lab, usually I don't really, I don't, I've never really said how much you can bring or not, can't bring, but people don't bring liters of bacterial cultures. It's usually already a small sample in an Eppendorf or so. so we work with small volumes. We do not culture the cells, but we do analyze them. We do open um, dishes, but sometimes, etc. So we have risks in our lab. It's not just not very severe. Okay. So, according to the World Health Organization, um, there are different biosafety levels, and they can you can put your um, biosafety levels in any of these categories. If we talk about the samples or the the agents we are working with, they, are, they can be put into four risk groups. Um, risk group one, there's no or low individual or community risk, and the microorganisms um, are usually unlikely to cause any disease or hazardous. It's the majority of the samples we receive are in risk group one. Then risk group, group two, it's a moderate individual risk, but the community risk is very low. The pathogen can cause disease. Um, it's not a serious hazard usually because there's treatment, etc. But um, serious infection is possible, but effective treatment and preventative measures are available. Then it's in a risk group two um, uh, sample. Risk group three is then when, where there's higher individual risk, still low community risk. And the reason for that is because there's uh, treatments available, uh, preventative measures. Um, the pathogen can cause serious disease to the individual but it does not ordinarily um, spread from one inf infected individual to another very easily. And then your risk group four, let me just go back, risk group three is usually your TB, um, I think uh, HIV fall in, could, could fall in this uh, class, but risk group four is are those diseases to which there is, it's a high individual risk, very high community risk, the path pathogen causes a serious disease, can be transmitted from one person to another, directly or indirectly, but effective treatment and preventative measures are not usually available. These are the Ebola labs that they have to open up there, high up in Africa. It is very, very dangerous because if you get the disease, there isn't really something, there isn't really treatment and preventative measures available. Now, we offer, as I said, we um, get a lot of risk group one, which we are 100% fine with that. We get sometimes risk group two, where it could have some risk to an individual working with them, but we do not accept anything in risk group three or four in live culture. If you fix uh, TB samples, they move from a risk group three to risk group two. So you can bring fixed 
HIV, fixed TB, fixed malaria samples, that's fine with us. Um, it's just that if it's something that can still cause a disease, then it's not allowed in our lab. Right. Now, let's look at the lab um, biosafety level. So the previous slide was on samples. Now I'm talking about labs. Um, a biosafety level one lab usually works only with risk group one um, agents. Uh, the laboratory practices that you have to apply is usually just main, mainly good microbiological techniques. PPE, although it's not, a, um, you don't have to, but it's definitely desirable to wear lab coats and gloves, but the, most of the work is open bench work. No, not many um, things to implement. Biosafety level two is where you can work with risk group one and two samples. You still have to apply good microbiological techniques, but there has to be a biohazard sign on the door and you have to uh, control the access to the laboratory. It's, it can't be an open door policy where anyone can walk in with, and, and no one knows who they are, have had training, etc., etc. PPE, um, lab coats, gloves and closed shoes, uh, long trousers, you, you do want to um, prevent um, contamination. In, um, cases where you work with, if, if you determine with your risk assessment that it is a, a quite a high risk sample that you work with, it might be necessary to wear eye protection, masks, sleeve covers. Whenever you work in our biosafety cabinet, I um, have sleeve covers available. So it's something that the, the one, these ones I've marked with the star is not necessary in our lab whenever you work with any of the BSL1 or risk group 1 samples. But um, everyone has to wear lab coats, gloves, closed shoes, because that's required in a B cell 2 lab. And then what's also required of a B cell 2 lab is to have a biosafety cabinet available to work with um, open containers of, of samples. Biosafety level three, you could bring in one risk group one and two. Um, it's usually just unlikely because there's so many things that you have to take into account, but definitely then risk group three samples. Um, the same practices would be required as in BSL2, but you have to have very strict controlled access and then directional airflow. Um, it's usually, I think it's a negative pressure or positive pressure. I don't know which one is called negative and which one's called positive, but basically all air has to be drawn into the lab so that nothing, no um, infectious samples are blown out of the lab. So it's all um, directional in, inwards to the lab. Um, you have to wear lab coats, double, double layered gloves, sleeve covers, hair cover, mask, goggles, shoe covers. Um, there might be other, other things that a specific lab would require, but it's a lot more PPE that's definitely required whenever you enter a BSL3 lab. Um, safety equipment, biosafety cabinet, and some other uh, primary devices might be necessary. Then these are four. These are the Ebola labs up there in Africa. I don't know I don't know if we have how many BSL4 labs there are in South Africa. I'm only aware of BSL3 labs. Um, the same principles as in BSL3 would be used. There would be an airlock entry. In other words, the, the doors have will close and um, the, there will be an anti-room. It's usually in BSL3 is also an anti-room where um, you won't be able to go into the second room until the if the first door is not locked completely. Um, there's a shower exit, there's special waste disposal, lab coats, double layered gloves, et cetera, et cetera. Very similar to BSL3, but they require a complete change of clothes when you exit the um, BSL4. Then um, biosafety class three. So biosafety cabinets also come in different classes, but they, they would require the highest level of biosafety um, cabinets. Uh, positive pressure suits. Um, in other words, they, any air would be pushed out, not sucked into your suit and it will be a double ended autoclave that you need. So in other words, you put your um, whatever needs to be autoclaved in on the one end, only from the outside you can take some uh, whatever is autoclaved out. There's filtered air, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, if you work in any BSL3, BSL4, there will be specialized training to work in such an environment. So my presentation here is not enough for you to say, okay, I can go into BSL3, BSL4. I also wanna say that about the BSL2, just because I present a BSL2 um, presentation doesn't mean um, you can just walk into any BSL2 lab and say you can. You need to be aware of what that lab's requirements are. They would have done a risk assessment for that lab 
like I said before, a, a tissue culture lab has a lot higher risk than my lab in, in SAF. So um, they will have specific requirements of for you to enter a, t a tissue culture lab compared to my lab, which is mostly analytical with very small volumes of um, hazardous material. Um, however, let me just go back. Um, because we're a BSL2 lab, everyone who enters my lab has to be aware of the risks that we are. We have samples of risk group two here. The person before you could have imaged bacteria, although you are imaging some food product, the person before you might have imaged some bacteria. So the, you should still apply the um, measurements that we have in place to protect our people. Okay. So what do we do to control this hazard is, hazard that, that it is in the lab? Um, in the SAF unit, the most important thing that you need to know is that, that we do not allow anything higher than risk group two. So risk group two and lower can, can be delivered to the lab. Um, as of this year, we on our certified BSL2 laboratory, they have evaluated our procedures, our SOPs, waste management, everything, and I have to abide by that to, um, to stay a certified laboratory. We didn't really introduce new hazards um, than we had before. The, um, in 2020, the university went on a very big, um, I, I want to say, they identified the laboratories who's not certified yet to make sure that we do certify based on what we already are doing. The laboratory had to implement these more stringent biosafety practices um, already because of the samples we, we receive. We didn't start new, new things like cell culture or anything. Um, we implemented a lot of the practices already. Our waste management is pretty much what we, we had to do before. Um, so you don't have to be scared, but it's much better now that we have um, stringent biosafety practices in place. So, all users, irrespective of what sample type you use, um, have to adhere to the minimum requirements. So, lab coats, gloves, closed shoes. I had people coming in flip-flops before. Um, unfortunately, that's not allowed anymore. You have to have your long, long trousers or a long, uh, long um, skirt or something um, and closed shoes when you come to, to the lab. We also have to have a closed door now. It's not an open door anymore. Um, and then all samples that may be infected or contaminated, such as plant samples that might, might have some fungi on, cell cultures which are live, human tissue like blood, um, they all should be handled as if there's an infectious agent present. You do not know that for sure. So um, we expect you to, to take it into account and think, okay, maybe there is something wrong with this or, or that I could um, bring to the lab. Right, so when we say we control hazards, there, there are different things that you can do. So this is the risk mitigation. The best that they would say is eliminate the hazard altogether. And, and um, if we talk about elimination of the hazard, make kill the samples basically, all live samples that you do not have to analyze live, um, inactivate them, fix them, bring them to the lab with the lowest risk possible. There is some options of substitution where you re replace the hazardous agent. Um, for example, there are strains of TB. You do not have to analyze TB, tuberculosis, um, mycobacterium tuberculosis, for example. You could um, analyze a, a typical, a, a non-pathogenic version for certain of the biological processes. I know sometimes it's necessary to analyze the, the true version, but then there are B cell three laboratories in the country and they are, um, we have flow cytometers in a BSL3. Um, there are other labs where you can work with live um, BSL uh, risk group three samples. If you can, rather substitute. Then engineering controls. This is where you bring the sample in and it still poses the hazard that, that we identified. But in whatever way we isolate the people from the hazard, that is where you use a biosafety cabinet. Um, you use an aerosol containment unit. Um, this is on the flow cytometer. I'll show you a little bit later. You have pipetting devices available, etc. And then building design. The fact that our, BSI, our biosafety cabinet isn't in the front door, right in the front door. Um, our lab isn't completely well designed in, uh, with the thinking of, of a BSL2 lab. But um, in other labs, you might find that they, they design it in a way so that the hazards are 
uh, eliminated by the design. We try to keep the um, where you open your samples as deep in the laboratory as possible because we we want you to, as you go deep in the in the, um, you shouldn't pass someone who's working with something that you could, that could pose a risk to you. Um, administrative controls is where you change the way that people work. You try and eliminate the behaviors that could um, be responsible. For, and they say they 90% um, of lab accidents are usually responsible. Uh, uh, is caused by people not working the right way. So that includes we have to do training. This is why this this presentation. You have your signage up in the lab properly. You have proper SOPs. They are checked. They are um, edited every year. You must have an inventory of samples or agents that come into the lab. And you'll see that these days we have a sample submission form where I ask a lot of questions about your sample. How dangerous is it? Is it GMO? Um, and I have to get that inventory as a control of the biosafety in the lab. Also, the medical surveillance. You'll also see in the sample submission um, form that I ask questions about the medical condition. Is there a risk for you to come into a lab where we have risk group two um, samples? Um, uh, like I said, pregnancy um, puts you in a whole different risk group yourself. And then finally, if you can't, if all these um, measures up um, in the first four points have been done and there's still slight risk, the best would be to protect the worker with PPE. Um, and we'll talk about that too. Right. I'm going to go through some of these again quickly in the next slides. Um, we request that wherever possible users bring only risk group one samples or fix and inactivate their samples. If you don't need to analyze a live sample, rather not bring a live sample. Um, secondly, um, I know some techniques, like our live cell imaging, cell sorting, requires the samples to be alive. That's fine. That's what our, our lab does. Um, we bought the instruments so that we can do these analyses, but then we have to take into account, we have to mitigate the risk a lot better. Unfortunately, any samples in risk group three or four must be adequately inactivated, fixed, heat treated. Um, it was always the case. We've never accepted for group three or four. But um, it is un it's necessary for everyone to realize that we do not accept that. Um, where possible, if it's used a non-pathogenic uh, variant, I've talked about that before. Um, the engineering controls that we have in the lab, we have a biosafety cabinet. Um, if it has to be used when you are working with a risk group two agent, everyone who works with risk group one agents don't, do not need to work with it. It's not necessary. If the, there are people who work with risk group two agents, um, they have to be competent to use this cabinet. There are certain ways that you work with a, a biosafety cabinet, um, and not everyone can just open the, the wood and say, okay, I'm, I'm doing it safely, I'll, I'll work with the, in the safety cabinet. You need to be trained as well to work, work in, inside it. Then with the flow cytometer, because we do lifestyle sorting, there's an aerosol management unit. Uh, the cell sorter creates aerosols while it's sorting, and um, the management unit makes sure that the um, sample, that the user or the person who do, does the analysis is not uh, exposed to that by um, the aerosol management unit. And then what none of us might realize, but the devices we use these days for pipetting um, are there for our safety. We don't do mouth pipetting anymore. Um, uh, it's not allowed at all anymore in, in my lab. Um, not that anyone did, but um, you have to use these puppet devices uh, to to handle your liquids. Right, so ad administrative controls. Now, I'm not going to go into too much depth in these, but we have now SOPs. Everyone has to read the SOPs and they have to confirm that they have read it and they are um, familiar with what is in the SOPs. Um, signage, we have a sign at the door that says biosafety level two, what the contact numbers are, what dress code is acceptable, the PPE, it's everything. We um, make use of online bookings. We've changed that a few years back. Originally, people walked into the lab and they wrote their name onto a, a sheet of paper. Um, it's already much better if no one has to enter the lab who wants to make bookings. So online bookings is improve, an improvement. Um, I'm introducing access control now. So you have to have an appointment with me or um, you have to have been fully trained to have access with your card. Um, we've introduced a new sample submission form 
that where I assess what level of training you have, what your medical surveillance, but also then the biosafety risk group of your samples. I have this new training procedure in, in place where I'll save this video and make it available to all our users. Um, and then what I'm going to do in, the, in, to, in part of the training procedure is to set up a questionnaire to see, are you familiar with the basic biosafety level two um, me measures in place before you may enter the, the lab? And then lastly, our waste management procedures and what, how we, we um, deal with the waste in the lab. So, lab procedures. Um, firstly, the sample tra transport. Um, mostly, the, it is required that you bring your samples in airtight containers or tubes, Eppendorf's and, and um, tubes that can be closed. If you have risk level two samples, it has to be in prim um, primary and secondary containers. So, your tubes must be in, in a tub that can close um, tightly. I know some of you bring bring food samples. I think if it's risk group one, it's still okay. Just notice that as soon as that sample enters this lab, it becomes has it could be in contact with something else that has been in the lab. So they can't be. You can't take your. I had pomegranates in the lab. As soon as I, the pomegranate is submitted to the lab, it's not food anymore. It's a it's a research sample, and it has to be discarded as any other other samples as well. And then we require that you label your samples correctly. Um, it has to have your name, surname, date, a description of some sort. What is it? Um, by safety level, so that we know if the sample is turning you what is in there, what level of safety is there. Um, if it's going to be stored here, please um, tell me it's a room temperature or four degrees, please. That's now if you have submitted and I can only analyze it the day after or something like that. And if there's specific post-analysis procedures, do I have to um, autoclave the sample or, or something like that? Um, then the entrance to the lab, whenever you come into the lab, um, I'm going to buy plastic containers because this was my major challenge is what do people do with their personal items? Um, it's not as if all everyone who enters the lab has a space here in the building to, to keep their stuff. So I'm going to provide containers into which you can put your personal items, take it with you, but close, close it and take it with you into the lab. But you can only take it out then again once you are completely done, washed your hands, etc. So yeah, entrance to the lab, put your personal items in a container, wash your hands and get your PPE on. Um, we'll talk about PPE in a minute. When you, oh, and then the, yeah, wash your hands, I did say. So. At the end of the booking, you have to discard your waste correctly. You have to clean your workspace, meaning um, spray ethanol, wipe their surfaces, make sure that there's nothing that could contaminate the next person when they enter the lab after you. Then only once everything's cleaned, you remove your PPE before you exit or before you get to the sink where you can wash your hands. And only after you've washed your hands, you can um, leave the lab. It's very important that the PPE is removed and you wash your hands. You should not walk around in the corridors with your PPE on. PPE. PPE stands for personal protection equipment. I, I didn't put the equipment in the heading, but it's personal protection equipment. It provides a barrier against skin or mucous membranes or respiratory exposure to pathogens. Um, it doesn't eliminate the hazard. The hazard is still not there. The sample is still as hazardous as it was. It just prevents you from having um, exposure to that hazard. And then um, it also prevents the spread of contamination. For example, if, if you've worked with E. coli in the lab, you were protected because you wore your PPE. But the moment you walk out the door and you go touch all the handles of the doors all the way down the corridor, you are contaminating other places with um, the E. coli. So that's why taking off your PPE is important before you leave the lab. Okay, here's the equipment in the heading. What does it include? Um, I know for COVID, all of us will wear masks, but also once COVID is over and, and you're still working with potentially hazardous samples, it is advised that you wear a mask. Definitely all people have to wear closed shoes and long trousers or long skirt. And then all users in our lab has to wear a lab coat these days with gloves. I would like you to bring a lab coat with. I have a few extra lab coats, but I do not have enough um, to for every user, every hour booking to come and have a lab coat. So I do have extras, but um, it is advisable if you can to bring your own lab coat. And then if you work with hazardous samples, um, which could sp uh, 
flash in your eyes or something like that, um, goggles is available. And then also if you work in the biosafety cabinet, we expect you to wear sleeve covers over the gloves and the lab coat. Um, that will prevent contamination of the samples as well. Right, so other do's and don'ts. I just have a long list of things that you may or may not do. The most important thing that I find that some of our users um, do not take into account up to now is that they are not allowed, they've never, eating and drinking has never been allowed in the lab, but I do get some traces of papers and, and a coffee cup or so. No eating, no drinking in the lab. Think about it, someone before you could have brought E. coli into the lab, and if you eat, you can be exposed to that to that bacteria. Um, only authorized persons are to enter the SAF unit. Do not give God access to someone that you are not supposed to. Um, I will, um, sorry, I will uh, ex escort anyone who books and have not been trained. Um, I will, I will supervise those people, but. Um, if you enter by yourself, do not bring your, your boyfriend or your sister or someone with you. Um, the lab doors should be kept closed. It wasn't always the case because we also had an open door um, policy, but unfortunately, BSL2 labs have to be kept closed. Um, <laughs> do not apply makeup, lip balm, etc. in the lab. You could uh, expose yourself to whatever risky um, samples was there. Avoid touching your face, mouth, eyes, even your, your contact lenses. Do not put them in, in the lab. Um, no mouth puppetting. I don't know who does that anymore, but it is a rule. No mouth puppetting. Do not take medicine in the lab. Do not um, get a panado out and, and drink it while you sit and wait for the sorting to take place. Um, it's not the time and the place. And then, as I said before, no PPE outside the laboratory. You can, can, can go and contaminate other things and other people. Um, do not over open holders with live sample outside the biosafety cabinet too. That may, that I'm specifically talking about cell cultures, uh, microbiological so um, samples. We have a biosafety cabinet for that. Um, vortex always with airtight caps. So if you put your um, if your vortex just before flow cytometry, for example, close the lid of the tube properly. And never leave your materials or contaminated lab way open to the environment outside the biosafety cabinet. That's not be specifically for people with hazardous samples, like live cell culture. Work with it inside the biosafety cabinet and discard out of it just after you're done. Um, everyone has to read and apply the SOPs because this presentation doesn't include everything. Um, there's a lot more detail in the SOPs. Um, if you store biohazardous uh, materials, it has to be clearly labeled sealed containers. Um, I do not allow lo long-term storage in SAF. It's, it's not a place where you can come and store all your samples forever. Um, it's only for those where I am, I've analyzed them and you still need time to get them, or you've uh, submitted your samples and I am only imaging it two, three, four days later. Um, you cannot, and this is a lab rule, no storage of food or drink or cosmetics or anything in the lab's fridge. It is a reagent fridge. There's a lot of dangerous things in there, carcinogenic reagents, etc. Do not put it in the fridge. Um, only, there are, um, as, as I said, there, there will be purse boxes for personal stuff that you can put your things in. Or you can ask me if you can place your coffee cup in the lab office while, while you wait or something like that, um, if I'm here. And then um, it is required of everyone to know the risks of the reagents they work with. You have to read your MSDS files for the reagents you work with. Right, there will be some um, MSDS files available in our lab for all the reagents we keep, but you have to, you know the reagents in your own samples. Right, we are almost through. When we do waste management, um, it is important to put your waste in the correct bin. Um, if you have live samples, it is now required to inactivate all the live samples after you're done with your culture plate or your, your tubes of, um, of sample to inactivate them with bleach uh, to a final concentration of 10%. That's in our SOPs. That was one of the main things that the ethics committee asked us, asked us to change and implement. The flow cytometry waste tank, uh, as you can think, there's a lot of live sample that just goes into waste. It has to be inactivated with two sachets of MediSure. Anyone who works with a flow cytometer 
Um, I usually teach them how to and where the sachets are, etc. But if I do not, because it usually comes up when you are in training that the, the waste is full. But if I, for any reason, skip that, just ask me where's the the sachets of Medicia that you have to put into the waste tank. Um, when you discard, you can seal. You need to seal the containers, close any lids, uh, put samples. If you can't, for example, a, a culture dish, you can't really. Um, seal the, the culture dish, you can um, put it into a plastic Ziploc bag, I've got them in the labs, um, and then you can discard them into any of in these correct bins. So the red bins are for samples, tissue, um, tissue paper, gloves, anything that had contact with um, possible hazardous sample. I do not want any tissue paper in these sharp bin. The sharp bins are there for glass lines and papet tips, which can um, puncture any, a plastic bag. The only um, other things that we, we do put in here is cotton wool, because um, they're small enough, but tissue paper itself fills this box very, very quickly, and then th that's not the purpose of this box. And then if you have chemical waste, we have EnviroServe green, green bins for chemical waste. Right. Decontamination and disinfection. So when you before you leave your the area that you worked in, we do uh, require you to, to decontaminate de or disinfect the area. Um, and it's also important if you come for, for lifestyle imaging or for sorting that you make sure that it's clean before you even start so that you do, do not contaminate your samples. Um, just a, a bit of nomenclature. Um, according to the uh, American Bios Biological Safety Association, they say decontamination is the removal or inactivation of biological agent. That's uh, the umbrella term. An antiseptic is usually only work used in medical facilities. Um, it's an agent that prevents or arrests growth or action of microbes, but they do not use the word when they're talking about surface decontamination. It's usually an, um, more solutions and things like that. So what we talk about when you talk about surface um, decontamination, it's um, in three different levels. You get a sanitizer, usually our hand sanitizers, for example. It's an agent that reduces the number of vegetative bacteria on surfaces. A disinfectant is a chemical that's a little bit more, um, more robust than a sanitizer. Uh, it inactivates viruses, kills vegetative bacteria, and it, it's a long list of things it can do, but it doesn't kill all forms of life. For example, bacterial spores might not be um, uh, killed by disinfectant. A sterilization um, when you use that term, it means that you are using a process or an agent that destroys all life forms, um, including biological spores or prions or, or things, like, things like that. Okay. So we use two chemical disinfections in, in our lab. The one is alcohol. At every workbench, there is a bottle of 70% um, alcohol. It is most effective at 70%, not at 100%. Um, they say it could be, depending on the on the type of samples you work with, it could require 10 minutes of exposure to ethanol before it's really, really clean. But unfortunately, it evaporates quickly. So we, we use quite a lot of ethanol in the lab to clean um, a lot. Um, it's flammable, so you should not close it to an open flame, which we don't have in the lab, but just, just so you are aware. And you shouldn't use it too much where there's vapors that will build up. Um, but I don't think our lab is a problem with that. Then chlorine and bleach, or bleach is a, a type of a chlorine product. It is very effective, but it is corrosive. It needs to be taken into account. Um, it also decomposes in sunlight or even higher temperatures. Um, they recommend to dilute the bleach one in 10. You know your, your bench, ach, the, the bleach that you would buy. You can use any commercial bleach and it should be made fresh, that dilution. Uh, we have that available in the lab. I've got a few bottles now. All right, so other things that you can use to decontaminate, um, UV, for example. Um, we have a UV inside our cryostat, so if you've used humans, of, if you've sectioned human samples, we have to switch on the UV after you've sectioned. Um, if you've uh, used the bio safety cabinet, uh, 20 minutes after you've, just for 20 minutes after you're done, we switch on the UV as well to decontaminate the bio safety cabinet. Um, if you want to use things that to remove nucleic acids, RNAs, DNAs, we do not provide them. You can bring them yourself. I know someone, um, we have a person who did uh, sorting for um, 
to do uh, uh, polymer reactions afterwards. <coughs> so you can bring DNA zap, DNA remover, DNA exit plus DNA free, RNA zap, anything like that, that would remove the RNAs, DNAs and nucleic acid. And then of course, if you want to make really sure that your the things that you work with, you can do autoclaving. Um, it's usually saturated steam with pressure at 121 degrees for something between 30 and 60 minutes. But your lab should, we do, we have, we use the, uh, the autoclave next door, so it's not available to our users. Um, you should have an autoclave in your lab if you have a, a biosafety level two lab already in any case. Okay. So last section, the emergency procedures of my lab. Um, the first thing, the emergency contact details are displayed in the unit. We have this um, sheet behind the front door. I have a, sh a smaller sheet next to the alarm code panel. And then where you work in the confocal Christ that room, there's another sheet um, up there as well. Um, I do require, because my uh, we do not have a lab phone in the lab itself, I'm in the office, that whoever works when I'm not here should have a mobile phone ready to use in emergency. We do not want you to use your phone while you work here. A BSL3, a BSL2, you should work have a, a phone only in a, in a Ziploc bag. I should add that to the presentation. But you should have a, a phone ready to phone in case of an emergency. If there's a fire, the fire escape plans are put up against the walls and on the corridor. So don't panic. Just look for the fire escape um, uh, labeling. They are there. Um, if the fire alarm is activated, as we do have some false alarms every now and again. We have a designated team of, of staff in the building that will investigate the incidents immediately. If the threat is imminent and the staff members know, okay, this has, we have to evacuate, we have manual horns that are, you will immediately know, okay, this, I have to get out. So um, with us, it's about two or three minutes and we know we have to, to um, get out. If you are working after hours, if the fire alarm goes off, evacuate. You do, you, we do not have that fire team um, after hours. Um, the fire extinguisher, which only should be used if there's a small fire, very small um, area, do not play hero, it's not necessary, but there is a fire extinguisher just outside the front door against the wall. So you exit my lab and right in front of you there will be a fire extinguisher. Um, if you have to evacuate, the assembly point, um, if there's a fire, is across the De Beers Street on, in front of the De Beers building but you will see the majority of people will go there. Right, in the case of a medical emergency, there is an emergency shower and eye wash station just outside my door. I think it's one is left and the other one is right on the right hand side of my, of my lab. Um, so it's really, really close. There's a first, first aid kit in my office. Um, and then there's also one for those people, if I'm not here, there's a first aid kit in the corridor um, closer to the main in entrance. It's um, next to room 207, 2007. So just walk along the corridor until you reach the first aid kit. Um, there are also dedicated first aid aiders in the building and their contact details will be displayed in the unit. But you can also call um, uh, campus, campus security. They will have uh, people on, on call if there's no one else in the building. For me medical in incidents, um, I will also have Campus Health ER24 contacts available um, and then that person should be taken to the medical facilities or an ambulance should be summoned. Um, it is important that all incidents have to be reported to Campus Health and Facilities Management, especially it's law that we have to report it within a day if um, for all the procedures to take place. You can't, cannot wait two days and say, oh, you, I, had, I forgot to tell you on Monday, I, I've cut my hand. It has to be reported within 24 hours. Okay, and that's um, very important. Electrical shock, um, that's the only other thing I think we've identified in my lab so far. I don't know, there's one more. But if there's electrical shock, um, the power supply should be switched off immediately, but you shouldn't touch or move the person. Um, it is important, you, you shouldn't expose yourself to the danger as well. Call the nearest first aider um, and, and the first aider should be, first aid should be applied. And then report the incidents to the facilities management, the same as I said before. 
um, it might be necessary. Just uh, uh, just coming back to take the person to um, ER, etc. So take the same type of, of um, precautions as with um, the medical emergency. Just do not touch or move the person. Rather, get um, trained people to work with the with the person. Unrest. If we have unrest like we've had on campus before, um, our front doors are, are kept closed. And people with card access may enter. So no one should shall open the front door of the building for any unauthorized person. Uh, we do not want to expose people inside to the dangers outside. If it's a serious um, like a, a, a demonstration or something, they get security personnel. Uh, they are contracted to guard the entrance of the building. So we are usually in a very safe environment if we are inside. Um, so if you feel un unsafe and none of these are in place yet, you can call campus security to um, either uh, escort you or in any event where you feel unsafe in the building. Right, I am done. Um, these are a few resources. These are the three main resources that I've used. Um, the American Biological Safety Association has a very nice video um, on fire safety. Then the World Health Organization has all the um, steps of a biosafe safe what's the requirements of a biosafety level two and then also there's another very nice video on this link here um, on safe working in the laboratory right i am done do you have any questions uh, i see julia has a hand up yes julia hello um I, I will be bringing live samples. There are grass um, generally regarded as safe, but it says there that I need to not open them in the safety cabinet. I don't have training on a safety cabinet. Sorry, I should I should add that it's uh, open live cells from um, in a in in risk group two. Um, okay. I know your samples, so um, they they are fine as as long as it's risk group one, it's fine. Um, but risk group two is the part that you have to work in the biosafety cabinet. OK, thanks. For those who work with biosafety risk group one agents and would feel more safe and, and you know that there could be other risks involved in your sample um, and would like some training in the biosafety cabinet, just make an appointment with me. I will train you, but just don't don't assume you can use the, the, the cabinet. I will just give you a short induction introduction and, and show you what to do. And um, it will be a, a small part of I will monitor your technique and, until you are comfortable in the biosafety cabinet. Um, I just wanted to add, whatever the rules are in my lab, as I said, we have actually quite low risk samples. Um, and even if it's biosafety risk two group samples, we do not culture, we do not um, vortex, but we do not do not centrifuge. So the, the procedures in my lab and the volumes that we work with is not as high as some other B cell two um, facilities. So you need to, Find out when you work in a BSL2 facility what their um, what their procedures are. You can't just take my procedures over to another to another lab. Okay. Any other questions? Right. Thank you very much for joining. I hope it was useful. Um, I'll make the video available next Monday. I just need a bit of time, a few days to to edit whatever parts I think is unnecessary, etc. And then I'm also going to design a questionnaire that I will, it should be quick. It should be a, a multi, multi, um, multi-choice questionnaire just to make sure that whoever enters the lab is familiar with the procedures and, and the expectations that we have. All right, um, if there's no more questions, I can greet you. Yes, Sylvia. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Sylvia. Um, you can have a good day and um, keep in contact with me if there's any other questions. All right, bye-bye everyone.